Thank you all for joining us here at I-80 Sports, where today we are previewing round one of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Guys, it's finally here. The playoffs are here, and we know what each matchup is. Let's break them down in this video. Guys, thank you once again for joining us here again at I-80 Sports. Thank you all for joining us here again at IAD Sports. Make sure that you check us out on our YouTube channel. If you're here already on our YouTube channel, thank you for checking us out. But we would greatly appreciate if you drop a subscription down below. Hit subscribe. Hit the bell notification because going forward, we're going to be going live with most of these videos. Only did it uh, preemptively today just because I had a little bit of extra time on our hands. And we wanted to get you guys a video right before the playoffs began. So that way you guys knew every single matchup going forward. But hey, we're going to be going live throughout the playoffs. So hit the bell notification so that way you know every single time we go live. And you can even join the conversation conversation throughout the video so who knows we might even highlight your comment in the middle of a video while you're here drop a like and also comment down below join the conversation who do you think is going to make it through the first round and who's going to be you know just on their way out and just right to the golf course after the first round join us in the conversation below and who knows we might even respond and you can also find our content down below at i80sports.com. You can find not only our NHL content, but also our NFL, MLS, NCAA football, wrestling content, and NBA content there as well. While you're there, hit up the shop, get yourself a t-shirt as low as $8. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you follow us down below at i80 underscore sports NHL. If you're following us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all of your support without you guys. We wouldn't be able to do this on a weekly basis. And actually, Twitter's actually going to be playing a bit of a role in uh, tonight's video. So if you want to be able to join the conversation on Twitter, you want to be a part of some of these videos, make sure that you drop a follow down below. We're actually really close to 1,000 followers. We'd love to get that maybe by the end of the playoffs. Hey, if you're watching this and you're not currently following, drop a follow. You won't regret it. Good content over there. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, how are you doing today? Doing well, doing well, and here we are. The season is over. The playoff matchups are set. Best time of year. I love it. Me personally, I'm still excited. It is a little it, It's a little different for me this time around. It's the first time. I mean, discounting the bubble in 2020, like I said, I hate sound like a broken record that my team is in it. But it was something I was thinking about before when I was driving around. I was just getting some errands done today, and it's like where your team is sometimes depends on uh, how you feel about this. If your team isn't in, I guess you could be upset, but at the same time, you can sit there and enjoy all the playoff hockey that you want with zero guilt. You can enjoy it all and not really care. There's other times where if your team is a low seed, it's like, okay, there's two schools of thought there. It's, okay, we're going for the upset, or it's the thought of impending doom. Okay, I'm going to watch at minimum four more games and my season's going to be over. But then there's also the feeling, too, when you're one of the you're one of the top dogs, you know, you're a President's Trophy winner or a number one or number two seed, and you're like, okay, we need to win the cup this year, or we need to go deep. And if we get knocked out in this first round, that's also the feeling of impending doom. So it, it is kind of nice, and I hate to say it, but like as a as a as a fan of the team that I'm a fan of, as a middle seed, it's like you can be excited for your team to play, but you can still be excited just for the whole thing to be happening. For me, I'm excited for the whole thing to be happening because my favorite team isn't even in the playoffs right now and actually could end up with a pretty high draft pick this year. So, hey, it means that the rebuild's pretty close to over and getting one more last high draft pick as a building block could be really, really nice. But for now, I'm just going to enjoy the fact that we've got playoff hockey. And at the end of the day, it's all about the friends we've made along the way. It's not always about the hockey. It's about the friends. Always about the friends. But Twitter actually played a little bit of a role uh, with uh, kind of deciding where we wanted to go in terms of uh, what we're thinking of who is going to win each first round uh, playoff matchup. Uh, I just put out a blanket statement on Twitter today uh who's gonna win x matchup and just threw up a poll for every single matchup that we're gonna break down and i'm gonna tell you what the results of those were today as well so let's get away right now we're gonna start right now with our first matchup to talk about uh, starting with the doozy here 
It's Toronto versus Tampa Bay. The Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Tampa Bay Lightning. I am so happy that we got this first round matchup because, you know, for Tampa Bay, this is a true test coming into, you know, a potential three-peat of Stanley Cup champions. They have to go up against quite the foe in the Toronto Maple Leafs. And Toronto fans are already, you know, writing down excuses as to why they might get knocked out in the first round. Uh, this is a quite a big first round matchup. So let's talk a little bit about some keys to victory for each team, as well as just some interesting news and notes to kind of watch out for throughout this matchup. Tom, let's start with you. What are some things that, you know, us casual viewers should be looking out for in this matchup? I mean, it's going to sort of come down to, um, uh, it's going to be star power versus star power. Um, Obviously the Leafs, you have Austin Matthews, you know, he is the Rocket Richard winner this year. But at the same time, you look over to the Bolts, and for many years, the Bolts, you kind of looked at their forward core, and you thought about guys like uh, Braden Point and Nikita Kucherov, and even Anthony Sorelli to a lesser extent. But there's one thing that the Bolts have this year, and I hate to say it because he's it's kind of like he's sort of an afterthought. He's sort of Maurice Richard on the 50s Habs teams where Jean Beliveau was dominating as number one guy. But Steven Samkos lately, man, has been scoring at a torrid pace, and he may be somebody to watch out for. Because you want to know what? I'll, I'll say it this way. For Toronto to win this series, their forwards are going to have to show up. I feel like you have a decided advantage in goal for Tampa and a little bit of an advantage on D with Tampa. But I feel like the forwards can be sort of a wash. Because remember, you have a Rocket Richard winner in Matthews over there. You have Marner. You have Tavares. But you go look over at Tampa and you still have point. You still have Kucherov. But uh, Steven Stamkos, man, he is on another level lately. I, it's crazy. He's playing. It's like he turned the clock back 10 years. I don't know where this came from, but I mean, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. He was injured two years ago. He had his moment of glory in the one game he played in the playoffs, scored himself a goal. He was good last year. Wasn't great, but was good for the ball to win in that second straight cup. But now you're coming in this year. And I'm going to say it right now, right now, he is the best player. He's the Bolt's best player right now. He is. And if you're so-called Fifth best player, if you really look at the depth chart, is playing at his best right now. That's a really good thing to have coming in. For me, first of all, good points all around. For me to kind of watch out for, this is going to be a high-powered first-round matchup. This is going to be a knockdown, drag-down you know, affair that I <laughs> think is going to go to distance. This is going to go to six or seven games. Almost guaranteed. It's going to be that close. The only way that it won't be as close is I think it comes down to goaltending in a lot of ways. I think Toronto is very matched uh, offensively with Tampa Bay. I think Tampa Bay is also matched up very equally defensively to uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. I think both are pretty even on both sides. I think maybe you give a little bit of the edge defense-wise to the Tampa Bay Lightning. But it comes down to the goaltending. In Tampa Bay's net, you've got Andre Vasilevsky, one of the best goaltenders in the entire world and still has been playing like one of the best goaltenders in the entire world. No, he's probably not going to be considered for the uh, Vezina Trophy this year, but that doesn't mean that he's not still in that conversation of you know best in the world, and he is one of the best goaltenders, period. And want to know what he also has to boot? Two Stanley Cups. What does the other netminder for the Toronto Maple Leafs not have? A Stanley Cup or a playoff round that has been won? Jack Campbell. So you have an interesting tandem for Toronto. They're going to go with Jack Campbell in net at least to start game one. We're going to see from there what's going to end up happening there because they do have another option behind him in Peter Mrazek. I would not be surprised if at some point we see Mrazek in this series. Mirazik is still hurt, though. He's still on the IR. So there's no shot of him actually coming back for this series, though. Well, no, he he can. He can, but as of right now, he's not going to play. So, Jack Campbell, it's you. And, you know, hopefully he still looks to be in the same form that he ended the season off. And, and to be honest, Jack Campbell was playing really solid hockey for the last month of uh, the season and looked – like the same form that he started off the season in if he can maintain that great for toronto um also expect a few fights in this matchup for sure this is gonna be a 
gritty affair. Toronto, not Toronto. Tampa Bay is known to be a little chippy in these matchups, especially in the first round and second round. They're really good at getting under team skins. Nikita Kucherov specifically is really good at getting under the opposing team skin. Would not be the least bit surprised if we see more of that in the first round this year for him. Uh, Steven Stamkos could very well go back on his tear that he ended the regular season off at. But on Toronto's side, they're no slouch either. We could see really good performances by Mitch Marner. We could see good performances by Austin Matthews. They have a lot to uh, live up to. You know, they were in this situation last year in the first round, and both of them laid a big fat goose egg. So you know both players are going to come in looking for redemption, looking for revenge, and who better than a first-round matchup than to possibly knock off the reigning, defending, undisputed Stanley Cup champions in the Tampa Bay Lightning. So that comes to our predictions right now. Who do we think wins this matchup? Tom, what do you think? Who wins this matchup? You know, man, I want to be on the Tampa hype train for three in a row. I love Steven Stamkos. I've always been a Stamkos fan. I love how he's playing right now. But at the end of the day, all good things, I guess, must come to an end. Um, With Tampa, they've won the past two Stanley Cups, but they didn't play 82 games for either of them. And I'm just not sure going into the playoffs how this team is going to handle coming off an 82-game season. I'm not saying it's going to be a short series because I, I, it's not going to be. Let's just face it. This series is not going to be a short series, no matter how you look at it. But at the end of the day, you know what? I think it could be very similar to that Washington-Pittsburgh series back from 2018, whereas uh, Washington's number was had for many years in that second round by whoever you want, whether it was Pittsburgh or whether it was the Rangers or whether it was even Tampa Bay, if you want to go way back to 2011. But I just think at this point, I think the Bolts luck is going to run out here. I'm going to give this to Toronto, and I'm going to give it to them in six games. I am. I think they finally get over the hump. I really do. I think Tampa's still a good team. I think that they could probably still win another cup within the next two to three years. But I just don't think it's going to be this year. I think I'm going with Leafs and six in this one. As much as I want to buy the Toronto hype as much as I want to say this is their year where they're going to shock the world. They're going to win multiple playoffs uh, rounds and really kind of legitimize themselves as a Stanley cup contender, perennial Stanley Stanley cup contender. I just don't know if I can give it to them this year. I just, I think there are a lot of question marks in net. I think there's question marks on the back end as well adding Giordano was great at the deadline if it doesn't pan out this year it's going to be a rough go for the next few years Austin Matthews is going to need to get paid in the next few years and he's not going to come cheap at all especially after a Maurice Richard performance this year scoring over 60 goals um I want to believe the Toronto hype, but that being said, Tampa Bay is getting hot at the exact right moment. Steven Stamkos is getting hot at the exact right moment. They've played consistently well all season long. And this is, you know, the majority of the team that has won two Stanley Cups. It's not going to be an easy matchup for Toronto. And I think in the end, it's going to go to distance, but I'm going to give it to Tampa Bay in seven games. It's a gut wrencher. It's going to go back and forth. I'm just willing to bet it's going to go back and forth. But I just, I have a really tough time. I have a real tough time counting Tampa Bay out completely in this one. Moving on to our next Eastern Conference matchup, we're talking about the Boston Bruins versus the Carolina Hurricane. Tom, what are some news and notes leading into this particular matchup? What are some keys to victory for both teams? What are some things to watch for? I mean, one big thing to watch for with Carolina is the goaltending right now. Their goaltending is questionable, to say the least. Freddie Anderson is out. You're putting Antti Ranta or possibly Peter Kochekov in net in a first-round playoff series, which in reality you're saying in a first-round playoff series, yes. Yes, understandable, but look at who your opponent is in that first round. It is the Boston Bruins. It's a team with a lot of experience. It's a team that, as I look at daily faceoff right now, I guess um, somebody forgot that Patrice Bergeron was still on the team. You know what it is? This is their lineup from the last regular season game, so they haven't updated it yet. 
That's why I'm looking at this and I'm scratching my head and I'm going, wait a minute, where is everybody? So I can't make those comparisons right now. But um, uh, the big thing here is the goaltending, yes. Now, not for nothing, you do have on the other end, Jeremy Swayman and Linus Allmark, who are good two-headed goalie tandem with almost no playoff experience either. But at the same time, at the same time, I still have to give the nod to the Bees just because of their experience. And here's another thing. They've had Carolina's number recently in the playoffs. Their combined record against Carolina in the last two playoff meetings is 9-1 and one over two playoff series. I'm not saying that this is going to be a short series for them, but you really look at the Bruins, and it's it's kind of um that Chicago Bulls documentary, that last dance narrative, and it almost feels like the same thing if you look at teams – in the past where they're giving their cores one more shot before, before it all goes away. And I feel like that's the underlying feeling in Boston right now. And you just look at them and you look up and down at the experience and not, it's, it's, it's not to say that Carolina is an experience because they're not, they're not an experience. They had that run in 19 that ended with the Bruins. They made the playoffs in 20 in the bubble also lost to the Bruins. And you know what? They gave Tampa a hell of a series last year, but lost. But I just feel like with Carolina is this. Carolina, when they run into somebody who's been there before, who has that championship pedigree, and I granted the Bruins only have that one cup, and there's not a lot of guys left over from that 2011 team, Sands, Bergeron, and Marchand, but there are a lot of guys left from the 2019 team that went to the finals. You have Pasternak and the like, and McAvoy, and so on and so forth. And it just seems to me that when you look at Carolina, it seems like any time they run into – an opponent, and it's not so much a superior opponent on paper, but just an opponent who's been through the trials and tribulations of these Stanley Cup playoffs, they always seem to falter. Add this add this uncertain goalie situation to it. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, the biggest factor here, the biggest factor here is the experience factor, and I think that's what Boston has. I really think that's what Boston has. You can match them everywhere except for goaltending, but in terms of experience, Boston is – far and ahead it's going to be an interesting first round matchup here because this is actually one of those matchups where i agree with tom in the sense that we could see an upset and i think this is probably one of the likelier places that we see an upset and i think it's just simply because with carolina losing freddie anderson potentially for a little bit of time in this particular series is going to be enough of a window for Boston to kind of jump out ahead early, depending on how long Anderson might be out for. We still don't know specifics about how long he might be out for. We don't know definitively that he's out for game one. If he can't go game one, it will be anti Ranta. But one thing to keep in mind for combined between Anderson and Ranta, they're your Jennings award winner this year. They were statistically among the best goaltenders in the entire league this year. So in Ronta's case, he can certainly step in for a game or two and really kind of hold down the fort for Carolina and they'll be okay. But is he as good as Freddie Anderson? No. Beyond that, is Freddie a proven playoff contender? No. His stats are overblown. He's not that bad of a playoff goaltender. But his stats certainly don't jump out in the paper and give you confidence in his ability to hold down the fort. Freddie has been great this year. He's probably going to uh, get nominated for the Vesna Trophy uh, this year. But there's still questions there. Uh, in Carolina's case, this is a team that is very offensively skilled. Uh, we saw a couple players this year that really kind of jumped out on the score sheet this year. Sebastian Ajo. Uh, Andrei Sveshnikov, Tevu Teravainen, uh, usual suspects in that regard. But towards the end of the season, rookie Seth, Seth Jarvis really kind of came into his own. 11 points in his last nine games to end the season. And he's a person really to watch in this series. He has been playing with a lot more confidence lately. It's his first playoff series. This could be a fun series for Seth Jarvis to kind of come out on his own and really show that he's here to stay. Uh, on Boston's side, this could be a potential last hurrah for Patrice Bergeron if he decides that he wants to walk at the end of uh, this particular playoffs. If he wants to actually test the free agency waters uh, in his upcoming UFA status, you know, this could be the last time that we see Patrice Bergeron in a Boston uniform captaining the Boston Bruins right now. 
So you know that he has some unfinished business. This is a team that does want to win a Stanley Cup. This is a team that is currently built to win a Stanley Cup. They have just as much offensive firepower as the Carolina Hurricane as well. Just to name a few players on this team that can certainly score uh, with the best of them. Brad Marchand, David Posternock, Patrice Bergeron, um, Taylor Hall. Uh, just to name a few guys on this team that certainly can find the back of the net, plus the really strong defensive play of Charlie McAvoy to end this season. There's some uh, whispers right now that maybe this is a kid that is going to break out next year, maybe finally get his Norris Trophy next year. He certainly has been one of the best defensive defensemen in the in the NHL to end this regular season. Unfortunately, he's probably not going to get the nod this year for the Norris Trophy just because there are a couple other guys that we're going to talk about later uh, that are going to make a case for that. But McAvoy is no slouch. Um, ultimately, this is also a goaltending matchup. And for Boston, you've got inexperience with Jeremy Swayman and Lena Solmark, but both very good goaltenders in their own right. Um, so this kind of brings us to who is going to win this matchup. How many games is it going to go? Tom, what do you think? Who comes out on top? I think we got an upset special here. I do. I'm going to go with the Bruins. I'm going to go with six games. I think the Bruins do take control at some point in the series. I think Carolina does fight back a little bit, but I just don't think it's going to be enough. And I just think at the end of the day, the inexperienced goaltending and just the inexperience all over – because of Boston's past playoff experience is going to be a huge factor here. So Bruins and six. I could easily see the Bruins winning this series. And I could honestly say, I will not be the least bit surprised if Boston upsets Carolina here. That being said though, I'm still going to hold on hope for Carolina to get passed into the second round. I'm going to say that this is a series that could also go to distance, six or seven games. Ultimately, especially if Freddie Anderson can come back and play and be a factor in this series, I'm going to say Carolina in six games. If not, and it's anti-Ranta, I'm still going to say Carolina in seven games in that regard. Uh, so it's just going to be interesting to watch. All right, Tom, time for your favorite matchup. We're talking the New York Rangers versus the Pittsburgh Penguins. So, Tom, take it away. What are some keys to victory for the New York Rangers here? What are some things to watch out for Pittsburgh? Uh, what do you expect in this series? I mean, it's, it's, it's going to come down to two big factors. The biggest factor, like I said, with the previous one is the goaltending. Right now, you have the Rangers with Igor Shesterkin in net and not to toot his horn, not to toot their, toot their horn. Shesterkin's the best goalie in, in the NHL this year. Bar down. You can't argue that. I'm sorry. You can't. It's not biased. It's facts. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say anything else. He's the best goalie in the league this year. But one little thing, and I've been reading some previews, is a lot of people are giving. They're saying, "Oh, well, it's defense and goaltending." Well, the Rangers obviously have it. Yeah, they do. Especially because with Pittsburgh, you don't know what's happening with Tristan Jari right now. You just don't. And Actually, it's gonna be, uh, note on Tristan Jari, he is slated to start Game One. I heard that he that he was going to be out for a little while. So I, that's the first I'm hearing of this. I heard he was. Last wasn't I checked, fight. they're gonna they're gonna start him. Last I had checked. So you're gonna start an injured goalie in game one. Uh, okay, yep. <laughs> it's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. Um, last all right. I yeah, I haven't heard that yet. I've just heard that he's not gonna play. Jason Zucker's not gonna play either for the Penguins. Yeah. So, um, see, this is what's bothering me is that this daily face. I'm trying to get some information from it. It just doesn't seem to want to uh, cooperate tonight. So I'm just clicking on Pittsburgh right now because there is something I want to visit here with them is that people are giving their defensive core an advantage over the Rangers. And I just, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see how Pittsburgh six defensemen that they will dress are better than the Rangers six defensemen. I I, I can't buy Brian Dumoulin, Chris Letang, Michael Matson, Chad Ruedel, Marcus Pedersen, and John Marino being better than Adam Fox, Ryan Lindgren, Jacob Truba, Keandre Miller, and the combination of Patrick Nemeth, Justin Braun, and Braden Schneider on that lower pair. Maybe even you'll see Zach Jones or Nils Lundqvist get in there if something does happen. I'm sorry. Call me biased. Say whatever you want. That pair that's a, the six defensemen dressed for Pittsburgh are not better than the six defensemen the Rangers are going to dress. I'm sorry. It's not. Uh, and the other thing about it is this. Fox is not going to win the Norris again this year. We know that. But he's still been a solid player all year. 
Ryan Lindgren doesn't get nearly enough credit from around from around the league. Ryan Lindgren's a very good stay-at-home defenseman who can chip in with a goal here and there. One of the best pairs all year in hockey has been Jacob Truba and Keandre Miller. So I don't under I don't see where people see that Pittsburgh's defense defensive core is better than the Rangers' defensive core. I I don't understand that. When it comes to forwards is where it it, it gets a little dicey. You have Crosby, you have Malkin, you have Jeff Carter. One, two, three down the middle. You know what? It's better than what the Rangers have down the middle. I will admit that. But at the same time, if you take all 12 forwards from Pittsburgh and the Rangers and you rank them 1 to 24, right now Artemi Panarin's better than anybody. Of the of the 12 forwards the Penguins have, if you take all 24 forwards, non-biased, doesn't matter who they play for, Artemi Panarin's the best forward in this series. Obviously, Crosby's won those cups. So is Malk and so is Carter. But they're all they're all they're all getting a little long in the tooth. The Jeff Carter contract, I never understood with Pittsburgh why they gave him that much money. I think Pittsburgh just at this point, I think the clock's ticking on them. I really do. I really, really do. With the uncertainty in net. With the superior D to the Rangers, I'm still going to say it's a wash with forwards. I really do. I think Pittsburgh has the experience. Crosby's still a great player. So is Malk and so is Carter. But the Rangers got the young legs. They do. You have Panarin, Kopp, and Strom. That line has been on fire. You have Kreider, who has 52 goals this year. You have Zabnika Zabanajad, who has had himself a decent year as well. You have Alexi Lafreniere, who is really tearing up. You have Capo Kako back. And if you want to look to the future for the Rangers, just watch that game against Washington the other night on Friday night. But say what you will, the biggest factors right now, D and the goaltending, and those are skewed heavily in the Rangers' favor. Yeah, I'm looking at this matchup right now, and I'm going to agree with you here. I don't see where people are getting it that Pittsburgh's defensive pairing is currently better than the Rangers. And this is coming from a Devils fan. Uh, the Devils, the Devils, the Rangers defensive pairing, I think has the edge over Pittsburgh. In this case, you can make a, you can make a case that maybe the left-hand side for Pittsburgh is a little bit stronger, but uh, where the Rangers make it up is on that right side. And you've got a two headed monster and Adam Fox and Jacob Trouba. And then you add uh, Braden Schneider potentially into the, that mix as well with how well he's played, especially towards the end of the season. This could be a very good series for the New York Rangers. Uh, some things to watch out for here uh, for me is Tr- the uncertainty of Tristan Yari for Pittsburgh, because currently backing him up is, you know, the usual suspect Casey to Smith. But the problem is who's backing up Casey to Smith right now. It's Louis Domingue. And it's not a very good backup situation there for Pittsburgh, like backup to the backup situation uh, in Pittsburgh's case. Any look, any team with Sidney Crosby is going to have a fighting chance. And honestly, this is a metropolitan rivalry between the Rangers and Pittsburgh. This is going to be a fight. This is going to be a hard nose knockdown drag out hockey. You know, every game is going to be physical for sure. Uh, I would fully anticipate, you know, some bigger bodies stepping up for the Rangers. Uh, Barclay Goudreau, Kevin Rooney, getting their money's worth, uh, probably having to go toe to toe with Brian Boyle one night throughout the series. Uh, Evgeny Malkin, probably getting chippy. Sidney Crosby, certainly doing his fair share and getting chippy, you know, but both teams are both physically capable, but both teams are also very capable of finding the back of the net. Uh, who better for the Rangers this year than Chris Kreider at doing that? Am I right? 52 goals this year for Chris Kreider. Uh, but Mika Zibanejad is no slouch as well. Andrew Kopp is the other name to really watch out for the Rangers in this playoff matchup. Ever since the Rangers had acquired him from Winnipeg, he has been money for the New York Rangers. And I think he only continues that in the playoffs for the New York Rangers. Uh, Artemi Panarin has also been fantastic as always. I'll be interested to watch how Alexi Lafreniere and Capo Caco do in their first real taste of playoff hockey. I think that they're going to be eased in. I don't think that they're going to be playing some serious minutes uh, in 
uh, the Stanley Cup playoffs because they don't need to play serious minutes right now. You know, they don't need to be out there, you know, 17, 18, 20 minutes. You know, they can be out there for, you know, about 14 to 15 minutes and be effective on the ice and also not get overexposed. And I think that will be the key to victory for the Rangers also. It's just not overexposing some of their talent and just making sure that, you know, there are bodies to step up for others when guys go down. Like if you got a chippy hit against Artemi Panarin or Alexi Lafreniere, is there going to be somebody else that's going to answer the call and answer the, answer the bell? You know, that's going to be the key to victory for the Rangers. Also, just the consistent play in net from Igor Shesterkin, who, as Tom mentioned, has been the best goalie in the NHL uh, this year, hands down. And he's got a more than capable backup as well in uh, Alexander Georgiev. So it comes to this. Who wins? Tom, why is it the Rangers? Short and sweet. Uh, Rangers in five. Yeah, I can't argue that. I'm going to say right now Rangers in five as well, and I wish it was closer, but I think the Rangers are going to have an easy go into the second round, but then whoever they have to face in the second round, good luck, because it's not going to be easy no matter who you draw. Which is fine. Up the- Which is fine. Yeah. It's a learning year. They mm-hmm. win. It. I don't know if they're going to win it all, but you know you learn from this. Exactly. Wrapping up the Eastern Conference here, we are wrapping up with the President Trophy winner this year, the Florida Panthers facing off against the Washington Capitals. Tom, what do you say here? What are some keys to victory for both teams? What are some interesting things to watch here? Well, the biggest key for Washington is the the health of Ovechkin. Short and sweet, man. He didn't play the last couple games of the season. They say he's going to be good enough to play in the playoffs. Yes. He'll be fine to play, but is he is he 100%? And I'm not so sure that he is. And in the past, they have put a lot of their stock into Alex Ovechkin in the playoffs. But to tell you the truth, Ovechkin is 35 going on 36 now. He's not the 25-year-old Ovechkin who you could play all those minutes. And if Ovechkin, depending on his, we know he's not going to be 100%. But if he's 65% as opposed to 80%, then what do you do? Then what do you do? You play him so many minutes a night against a younger, hungrier Florida team. And I know I said I'm not buying what the Panthers are selling. But right now I might have to. Because Washington's going to put entirely too much into Ovechkin when Florida has the weapons like Barkov and Duclair and Huberto and Giroux up top. And Washington, you still have Oshie, you still have Ovechkin, you still have Backstrom, you still have Kuznetsov. But the biggest factor there is how healthy is Alexander Ovechkin? Because the only place where Florida can mainly match with Washington really is the forward. It, it, rather, other way around, Washington match Florida really is forwards. I guess D to a lesser extent as well, depending on the health of Aaron Ekblad, as opposed to Washington's John Carlson, who is healthy. And then when you go to goaltending, you, you kind of do have a two-headed monster just in case in case Bobrovsky's not who you got. You throw Spencer Knight in net. And if Washington still had Braden Holpe right now, I could say that, okay, Braden Holpe could go out there and steal you, in a, steal you a couple games. But Vitek Vanacek, I, I can't sit there and say, okay, they'll be fine with this guy. And like I said before, we discussed Holpe earlier in the season, and maybe Washington getting rid of him wasn't the smartest idea. But at this point, it's too late now. It's too late now. So it, it, in reality, in reality, it's the health of Ovechkin for Washington and to a lesser extent, the health of Ekblad for Florida. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to keep it short and sweet on this one. It's Florida's, Matt. It, this is Florida's round to lose in a lot of ways. Florida has all the firepower. Uh, they have been one of the best scoring teams in the entire NHL. Jonathan Huberdeau, who is probably going to be considered for the Hart Trophy this year, uh, has been electric this year, just making plays out of nowhere for this Florida Panthers team. And they have the firepower. They've got Huberdeau. They also have Alexander Barkov. They've got Claude Giroux, who they acquired at the deadline. They've got Sam Reinhardt, who they acquired in the offseason from Buffalo. You know, this is a team that could be very exciting to watch. What could be their Achilles heel going into this matchup, though? Uh, potential defense and goaltending issues. 
Uh, we have seen a little bit of inconsistent play towards the end of the season from Sergei Bobrovsky and uh, Spencer Knight might not be ready to answer the bell, especially having to answer the call last year in the playoffs. Um, Aaron Ekblad, he might not be ready for this potential playoff series. He might not be ready for the playoffs in general. We're just going to have to watch and see what happens there, but that's an anchor on your defense that you're currently missing. And that is huge. Um, on the other side of things for Washington, uh, it's Alexander Ovechkin's show. I mean, this is a guy that has been leading uh, the Washington Capitals this year, last year, probably even going forward. But he can't do it by himself. Other people around him need to step up and play. You need to have good, consistent play from Evgeny Kuznetsov, who I could see easily leading in scoring uh, in this playoff matchup here. He's been playing very good hockey as of late. Uh, Tom Wilson is also more than capable. He's really good at getting under under t- uh, a team skin. And actually for Florida, this is the perfect team to kind of get a rise out of. Uh, hopefully he doesn't get too overzealous and gets himself suspended. But, you know, could be interesting to watch. Tom hit it on the head. The very un- the huge uncertainty in that for Washington is going to kill them, though. Vitek Vanacek has been pretty good but wildly inconsistent and Ilya Samsonov has been non-existent this year he has gone from a elite level prospect to a potential serviceable backup at this point so it's really I just don't see Washington doing well in this series and it sucks to say that but this could be the first uh this could be the first first round win for the Florida Panthers in quite some time. So that being said, segues are weird. Tom, who do you think wins this series? I'm going with the Panthers in five. Um, I know I said I wasn't buying what they were selling, but I, I it's too obvious for this one. It's after this series what happens with them is what's <clears> going to be the question mark for me. But Panthers in five, first playoff series win since 1996. Yeah, and for me, I'm actually going to be a little bit more mean. I'm sorry, Washington fans, and I think that the Capitals are still a decent team. I'm going to say Florida in four. I think we've got a sweep special here. If there's going to be any series that sweeps, there's this one, and then there's another one that I'm going to talk about later. And I think this could ha- have the potential sweep written all over it. Before we hop into the Western Conference matchups, guys, just to remind you guys down below, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the bell notification, and also make sure you drop a comment letting us know what you guys think so far because we greatly value your input. Let us know down below while you're there. Drop a like, especially if you like what we're talking about here. Moving on to the Western Conference, we got to talk about maybe the obvious matchup first. It's the Colorado Avalanche versus the Nashville Predators. The Colorado Avalanche, who are coming in as one of the best teams in the entire Western Conference, a Stanley Cup favorite potentially. Uh, But we got to talk about some things for both teams. What are some things to watch here for Tom? We'll start with you. I mean, right now with Nashville, it's really the health of UC Soros. Um, He's potentially not going to play. And if that's the case, it opens up the floodgates for Colorado. One thing for Colorado, it's a playoff special every year. It's Nazim Kadri. He likes to go out and do stupid things when he shouldn't be doing stupid things. He's had a great year this year. He really has. He's had himself a nice year. At one point, was leading the team in scoring. But he needs to keep himself in check because he seems to get it. He got himself in trouble last year when he probably shouldn't have. So those are two big things for me with this series. It's it's the health of Saros and whether he even suits up. And hopefully Kadri just doesn't get dragged into something where he does something stupid and gets himself suspended again. Yeah, it's that. It's like Tom Wilson. It's like that train's never late and you know what's going to happen at some point, but you're just not sure exactly when. I don't think Kadri gets himself suspended suspended in this matchup i think he's actually going to be rather tame in this one uh but who knows stranger things have happened i'll tell you the one thing i'm excited for in this matchup because a lot of people are going to write this matchup off and say this is obvious it's colorado and four whatever move on there's one fun thing about this matchup that i'm excited to watch and that's the two biggest 
nominations for the Norris Trophy this year facing off against each other. Roman Yossi for Nashville and Kale McCarr for Colorado. That is going to be electrifying. That's going to be fun to watch. Roman Yossi is not going to go down without a fight. It's funny because back in February, Kale McCarr was taking off in the Norris race. And it seemed like out of nowhere, Roman Yossi was just like, oh, wait, hey, I'm a Norris caliber defenseman. And then literally just turned on the Jets and did not look back. Roman Yossi has been the best defenseman in the entire NHL this season. Bar none, he's my Norris Trophy winner this year. I truly think that he is walking away with that Norris Trophy. Kael McCarr is going to have to wait. But he, Roman Yossi is going to be the person that will keep Nashville in this matchup, especially if Soros can't go for the Nashville Predators. Um, the Predators aren't a slouch, though. This is a team that can score. Philip Forsberg, Matt Duchesne, Mikel Granlin, Ryan Johansson. You know, these are all just a few names that have found the score sheet this year and have done very, very well this season in general. And I don't know. I think Nashville is a team that should not be underestimated. And I think Colorado would be very foolish for underestimating the Nashville Predators. I think there's a lot more going for this team than a lot of people actually realize. But if Soros can't go for Nashville, that's it. I just, there's just no way Nashville can win the series without Soros. On Colorado's side, one thing to watch out for me is their net. Darcy Kemper, this is the first time that he's going to be walking into the playoffs as a member of the Colorado Avalanche. He's not a complete stranger to the playoffs because he did go to the playoffs during COVID with the Arizona Coyotes, but Arizona kind of quickly went out. And Darcy Kemper didn't play that great during that series. Can he make it up against the Nashville Predators? I think he could. And you have your usual suspects to really watch out for in Colorado. I mentioned Caleb Carr before, but you got one of the most potent lines in all of hockey playing right now with Nathan McKinnon, uh, Miko Ranton, and Gabriel Latticon. Expect that to continue for the Colorado Avalanche. Plus, you have more than capable players uh, with the likes of Alex Newhook, who's been playing well, with uh, Andre Burakovsky, who's also been playing very well, Nazem Kadri, as Tom mentioned before. You know, this is a team that can play very, very well, and it's Colorado's matchup to lose. So, that being said, Tom, who wins this series? You know what? Like I said, the health of Saros is uh, imperative here, and whether he comes back or not is a huge deal. So if we're going to go under the assumption that he's out right now, I'll still be generous. Avs in five. I'll be generous too, and I'm going to agree. I think Nashville takes at least one game. I think that they're going to surprise and they're going to take at least one game. I'm going to say it's game one. I say they actually take game one and kind of like send some shockwaves of just like, oh my gosh, could like Colorado like really like fall off a cliff? And Colorado's just going to come back and just reverse sweep it essentially and just – take the next four games after that i think it's going to be colorado in five i think nashville does have the capability of winning at least one of these games who knows maybe they steal two stranger things have happened next we have the los angeles kings versus the edmonton oilers tom what are some things to watch for this matchup what uh could be the difference maker for both teams well the biggest difference maker right now with la is that drew dowdy's probably not going to play and I guess if you really look at it besides that, you look at Edmonton and you sit there and you say, okay, you have McDavid and you have Dreisaitl, two of the top five players in the league, dominant forces when they're on the ice. And here they are walking into a team from yesteryear who still has some of that core from those cup years, guys like, Anze Kopitar and Dustin Brown and the like. And here they are walking on in and, you know, here they are. It's time for them to get over the hump. And they're finally going to knock off a team from yesteryear, a team that had won their cups but now is on the downfall. And wait a minute, where have I heard this story before? Oh, yeah, that bubble two years ago against the Blackhawks when I went in there and pretty much lost. Yep. <laughs> yep. Pretty much. So... It's talent versus experience. It's Dustin Brown's swan song. Um, 
It's going to be it for him after this. He's going to retire after these playoffs, after captaining L.A. to two Stanley Cups in three years and then getting the C ripped off his jersey two years after the second cup, which is still the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But besides that, um, goaltending is a little bit of a wash here, I think. I mean, you still have Quick with L.A., but he's technically going to be their backup. Um, Edmonton's goaltending's always sort of been up and down. But I, th- you, you know what it is here. The, the biggest factor are the fo- it really is forwards. Do Kopitar and Dustin Brown and Philip Deneau to a lesser extent, do they have enough to beat these guys? Because the thing with Kopitar, well, not with Kopitar, I'm sorry, with McDavid and Dreisaitl is this. Last year they were shut out, and I'm sure that's in their head, that they went in last year and did nothing. And I know they're going to want to go out there and make a mark this year. So I guess, yeah, that's really the biggest thing is right now the goaltending is sort of a wash. I'll give the D a little bit of an edge to Edmonton, but that's not saying Edmonton has Norris Trophy caliber defenseman there. So it's how the forwards respond. It's how McDavid and Drysdale, do they finally want to get over this hump or does the experience bug bite them again like it bit them with Chicago two years ago in the bubble? This is going to be one of those matchups that I could see it going either which way. A lot of people are writing it off and saying Edmonton's going to walk their way into the second round, and that's about it. I don't think it's fair to write off the LA Kings just yet in this matchup, and I think it's just simply because Edmonton still needs to prove it to me in the playoffs because like Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl are perennial Art Ross contenders. I mean, hell, Connor McDavid has officially won his fourth Art Ross Trophy this year. Fantastic. Win a playoff series. Go further into the playoffs before I can actually crown you anything. Because right now, it's the Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl show in Edmonton right now. And what else do they have to show for it? A 41-year-old goaltender in Mike Smith. I just don't see that actually giving them the edge. Whereas with LA, I actually do give them the edge in that because of Cal Peterson, who has played pretty steadily this year, to be quite honest. It's been his net. And Jonathan Quick and his limited action has not been bad either. And he is no stranger to high-pressure situations. If Jonathan Quick gets a nod on certain nights that, uh, during this series, I don't think he's going to disappoint. You know, he loves, he thrives in high-pressure situations. Uh, but then beyond that, the Kings also have the firepower to boot. Adrian Kempe has been very good this year. Anze Kopitar has been very good this year. Dustin Brown, even, you know, not the career renaissance that he had last year, but certainly still effective. Plus, you also have some younger players who have been contributing steadily for this team. Quentin Byfield has been uh, steadily contributing. Arthur Kaleev, Gabriel Velarde, Carl Grundstrom, all guys that are going to get their first taste of playoff action. And it won't, I'm going to mark my words on this one. It won't be their last. What is going to kill LA is not having Drew Doughty. That's going to be a killer for this team because without him, this is a pretty barren defense. Uh, at the moment, you have Alexander Edler, Troy Stetcher, Mikey Anderson, Oli Mata, just to name a few guys. Uh, it's it's pretty pieced together right now. The defense is what they need to focus on in the offseason. But that being said, the Kings could honestly take this series. So that being said, Tom, who wins and in how many games? Oilers, I'm going to go with. Five or six, I'll probably just say six right now. You know, I think L.A. is going to get one win at home just on the fact that it could be Drew. Um, not Drew Dowdy, I'm sorry. Dustin Brown's last playoff game in L.A., I think that that rides them the one win at home. Maybe they pull one upset win off in Edmonton on the road, but I think this is it. Edmonton finally does get over the hump and wins this wins a first-round series. So I'm going with the Oilers here in six. I really want to say the Kings because I really, I really do like the Kings this year. And even going forward, I really just like how they have rebuilt this team and kind of built around similar players from when they last won the Stanley cup, building around Anze Kopitar, building around Drew Doughty and it's paid off. And this is a team that certainly, this is not going to be their last time getting back to the playoffs again. They're probably going to be in the conversation next year and for years to come. 
Uh, but that being said, yeah, I'm going to agree with Tom here. I think the Oilers do essentially get over the hump. I don't think it's going to be in five games, though. I actually think the Oilers will have to work for it. It is going to be touch and go. There is going to be a night where Connor McDavid doesn't show up. There is going to be a night where Leon Dreisaitl doesn't show up. I'm going to say the Oilers in seven. And then from there, good luck from there. Now for the matchup that I'm most excited for, it's the Minnesota Wild versus the St. Louis Blues. My chair keeps falling and it makes me feel short. But, Tom, this is the one I've been waiting for the most. This is the one that uh, we've known this matchup for the past week and a half now. Things to watch for. What should we be hyped for? I mean, one thing to watch for, the biggest factor here right now is the goaltending. Right now you have two teams that have a two-headed goaltending monster. The difference is in Minnesota, you have a short thing, and no matter who you start, whether it be Flurry, whether it be Talbot, you have a short thing, no matter who you have between the pipes that night. St. Louis, not so much. Biddington won you a cup three years ago. First cup ever in franchise history. Was a hero to the city, a hero to the organization, a hero to Blues fans worldwide. But he hasn't really been picking up his end of the bargain as of late. And then you have Billy Huso, who really has been picking up the slack for the Blues. Big reason for the Blues' success this year. But Billy Huso, at the end of the day, also has no playoff experience. So hypothetically, say you go into Minnesota in game one and you get shellacked. The Wild destroy Huso. Then you throw Biddington in there in game two because you don't know what to do. And he loses. So then what do you really do? It's almost, and I'm not even saying this because... It's almost reminiscent of the Atlanta Thrashers, the only time they ever made the playoffs, when they were juggling Carrie Lantanen and Johan Hedberg. Obviously, these two guys are a lot better than them two, and obviously the St. Louis Blues team is a lot better than that Atlanta Thrasher team that the Rangers made. Uh, Rangers had their way with pretty easily. But the goaltending to me, especially on the St. Louis side, is a huge, huge factor. We can talk about the experience that we spoke about a week ago where you have Kirill Kaprizov and Kevin Fiala out there, and they're both good players. But on the other end, you have Ryan O'Reilly and Vladimir Tarasenko who have won the Cup. But at the same time, it's not like Kaprizov and Fiala never played a playoff game either. It just so happens that those two guys on St. Louis went a little bit further. But, yeah, the goaltending to me is going to be a huge thing because Minnesota knows that they have a good goalie no matter what happens. St. Louis – they got they, if something does go wrong early on, it's going to be a big head, head scratcher for Craig Berube and Co. It really is because it, it, if they can't figure out who they want to have in net and the rotating is screwing both of those guys up, they're going to find themselves in a hole that they're not going to be able to dig themselves out of. Agree. First of all, I'm just hyped for this matchup in general. I just want to read real quick for everybody. The last two meetings for the Minnesota uh, Wild and for the St. Louis Blues, both times, spoiler alert, the Blues did win both matchups, but they were close. Four to three in regulation, six to five in regulation. So both teams can really hang with each other, and each game is going to be close. That's the first and foremost. On Minnesota side, you've got – uh, some interesting names that are going to be returning uh, right now, just in time for the playoffs. Matt Zuccarello practiced uh, today, Sunday, and he's going to be ready for game one, which is really exciting to see because he's been playing very, very well this season in general. Um, a lot of things to really look forward to for Minnesota. Minnesota can score very, very, very well. Kirill Kaprizov. 108 points this year kind of out of nowhere too in the past like week and a half he's been one of the best players in all of hockey literally skating laps around teams um kevin fiala is just on another level i still am baffled that nashville gave him up so quickly and he really turned around his career in Minnesota. And this could also be Kevin Fiala's last time in Minnesota. He could be on a different team at the start of the 2022-2023 season. Beyond that, they have – Minnesota Wild, that is, have a good support system 
behind these stars, behind Kirill Kaprizov, behind Matt Zuccarello, and behind Kevin Fiala. Matthew Boldy has played some very good hockey as of late. Marcus Foligno is also going to be coming back in this series, has also played very well. Joel Erickson Eck, Jor- you know, Jordan Greenway. And you also have guys that can step up and be physical. Jordan Greenway was one guy I mentioned. Marcus Foligno was another person I mentioned. Nick Delorier, who they acquired from the Anaheim Ducks earlier this year is another guy as great insurance. The other thing that's going for Minnesota, just lock down defense. I really like their top six, and I think I favor it more than uh, St. Louis's top six. That being said for St. Louis, St. Louis, they won their last two matchups against Minnesota. So Minnesota is going to have to work against St. Louis. Billy Huso has been very, very good this year, and he has been one of the main reasons that the St. Louis Blues are in the playoffs and in the position that they're in. Uh, St. Louis's top six, it says it's it's really strong. Pavel Buchnevich, Robert Thomas, Vladimir Tarasenko, Brandon Saad, Ryan O'Reilly, David Perron. These are all quality individuals and very, very capable hockey players. And you also add into the mix uh, Ivan Barbashev, you know, Jordan Cairo, all really good players. Where I think they don't match up is defensively. Tori Krug and Colton Pareko, fantastic. Justin Falk, also very good. Nick Letty, not bad. That bottom pairing is just, it's not as good as Minnesota's. I think Minnesota has the edge with John Merrill and Dmitry Kulikov on that bottom pairing. Uh, beyond that, Billy Huso, this is his first playoff series, and he's facing off against Mark andre Fleury on the other side with Minnesota. It's going to be a really good series. This is my series to watch for sure. This is the one that I'm going to pay close attention to. But, Tom, who comes out on top? Well, you want to know what? It's something I was listening to on uh, the NHL channel on, uh, on XM the other day and talking about just how the atmosphere in Minnesota has been getting lately. And it's actually something I love because I always felt that Minnesota, it's a big hockey state for those who don't know. Um, huge, huge, huge high school, high school hockey state. The state tournament sells out every year there. Huge college hockey state with the Minnesota Golden Gophers and all the other colleges in the state. Minnesota to lose St. Cloud State, just to name a few. We're not, we're not going to we, – we can do a whole episode on Minnesota high school and college hockey one day if people want us to do that. We can totally do that for you, but we're not going to do it right now. Um, but it's just it, – it's nice to finally see Minnesota getting behind an NHL franchise. The North Stars were run like garbage. And even the Wild, to, at, at, in the beginning, were run like garbage. They just figured if it's Minnesota, anybody will show up and we'll just bring as many American and Minnesota natives onto this team, and that'll sell tickets, and obviously it doesn't. People want the best team you can ice, no matter where anybody's from. North America no, – Minnesota, Boston, Canada, Finland, Sweden. Just you name it, throw it in there. But the thing is, is that the fans are finally getting behind it. They've had a great road record. A great, I'm sorry, a great road record. A great home record this year. 31 8 and 2 at home this year for the Wild. The Blues at the same time have had, had themselves a nice road record, a nice home record. I don't know why I keep saying road record because it's got nothing to do with what I'm trying to get at right now. 23 12 and 6. No, that's their road record. I want their home record. <laughs> I had their home record up. Um, home record. Here we go. Uh, 26, 10, and 5 for the Blues at home this year. So what's the trend I'm getting at here? Both teams are very good at home. And I think this is going to be a series where the home team wins every game. But at the end of the day, it's a seven-game series, right? And who has the home ice advantage? The Minnesota Wild. So... I'm going Minnesota in seven here just based on the fact is that they have that home ice advantage. So Minnesota to me is my dark horse team to watch in this playoff. And I think Minnesota is going to turn a lot of heads. No knock on St. Louis whatsoever. St. Louis is certainly going to put up a fight and not make it easy at all for Minnesota in this matchup. But ultimately, I'm going to agree with Tom here. I think it's going to be Minnesota in seven. I also wouldn't be surprised if it's actually shorter than seven games. But I would really like this series to go to distance just because 
it's just going to be fun hockey to watch. To be honest, this is going to be this is as close to old time hockey as you can possibly get. And the, the, is it bad that I just so badly want to see Jordan Greenway and Colton Pareko come to blows, just because you have the two largest mammals like on either <laughs> side? Just uh, please, I want to see these guys throw haymakers so bad. It's just so so bad. I want to see a heavyweight match there. I know I'm not going to get it, but let me dream. Let me dream. But yeah, Minnesota in seven. That's what I'm going to say. We've come to our final matchup of the first round. It's the Calgary Flames versus the Dallas Stars. The Dallas Stars squeaking in much to a lot of people's delight because it wasn't the Vegas Golden Knights. Um, <laughs> Tom, what are we going to watch out for in this series? I mean, it, you know what? This one is... um. Uh... It's weird because you you have factors on each end, but none have anything to do with each other. It's like, okay, Calgary, Johnny Goudreau had a great year, and Daryl Sutter whipped them into shape, granted. And then you have Dallas, who still has guys like Jamie Benn and Tyler Sagan. But right now, you can say Dallas' is best player right now is probably Jason Robertson. I, I, I think you can't argue that fact. But the thing is, it's like, for whatever, both teams have advantages – but I feel like the advantages don't have anything to do with each other, if that makes any sense. So it's 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 I sit here and watch it, rather watch it. I look at both teams' depth charts, and I go, I, I want to find something that would be that that is strength of one side would contribute to weakness of a different side. But I, I it's it's this one's very difficult because it's just it's hard to tell. Obviously, Dallas is maybe a little more loaded on the veteran side with guys like Sagan and Pavelski and whatnot and Jamie Benn, obviously. And Dallas, remember, is two years removed from going to a Stanley Cup final. But just the way Calgary has played this year, they have a lot going for them as well. Hold on one second. Like, I look at them. You have Johnny Goudreau. You have Matthew Kachuk. And you have a coach behind the bench down there in Calgary who has done it. He's won two cups in L.A. Whereas in Dallas, you have Rick Bonus. Rick Bonus has been in the league a very long time. But the only time he ever came close was two years ago. So I guess if there was a factor here, if there was to be one at all, it may just come down to the coaching. It may come down to coaching. And coaching can win you. Games in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They can. You want to go back, speaking of Dallas, you, you go back to 1999 when they played against Colorado in the Western Conference Finals. And Colorado probably did have a better team. But you want to know what? Colorado's coach was Bob Hartley. Dallas's coach was Ken Hitchcock. Colorado lost that series to Dallas because they were outcoached. Plain and simple. And that's what I think is going to happen here. I think it's the coaching experience is what's going to is what's going to be the biggest thing this year in this series. It's who can out coach the other. Can Rick Bonus outdo Daryl Sutter, or can Daryl Sutter outdo Rick Bonus? That for me is the biggest thing right now. Yeah, I think coaching is going to be a major factor here for uh, the Calgary Flames and for the Dallas Stars. One big note for the Calgary Flames here. You have three players, not three. You have three players that have scored over 40 goals, and you have four players that have scored over 35 goals. Andrew Maggiapani, 35 goals this year. Elias Lindholm, 42 goals. Matthew Tuchuk, 42 goals. Johnny Gaudreau, 40 goals. You also had Johnny Gaudreau and Matthew Tuchuk also, you know, are one of those eight players that have scored over 100 points this year. Uh, both players have been unreal this year. And Elias Lindholm, also a point-per-game player with 82 points in 82 games. This team also boasts among the best plus-minus in the entire league. They really, really, really thrive five-on-five. Five. They play really, really well five-on-five. Five. What gives me a little pause for the Calgary Flames is scoring depth. Beyond Andrew Mangiapane, who scored 35 goals this year, your next highest scorer is Dylan Dubé with 18 goals. I'm not saying that's bad by any means, but 
they're going to need to rely on some other names to, you know, pick up the slack and score. That being said, you have some more than capable players on this team currently for the Calgary Flames who can pick up that slack. The four names that I mentioned before are names that can certainly step up and do it. Kale Yarncroft can also step up when needed. Tyler Toffoli, don't forget that the Calgary Flames also acquired Tyler Toffoli at the deadline. And the bigger signing in the offseason, Blake Coleman, who has also won two Stanley Cups at this point. Calgary has some very interesting players on this team to watch uh, in general. The defense has also been very good this year. Uh, just off the bat, off the top of my head, that players that have played well this year, their top four, Noah Hannafin and Rasmus Anderson, Oliver Shillington and Chris Tanev, four players that have been absolute rocks for the Calgary Flames. And last and certainly not least, Jacob Markstrom has been automatic in net for Calgary this year. He has been very steady, very, very good. On Dallas's side, there's nothing to really – you know, scoff at for Dallas. Dallas, you know, really scratched and clawed to get to the Stanley Cup playoffs this year. And it was on the backs of Joe Pavelski. Joe Pavelski having a career year at the age of 37, an 81 point game, an 81 point game, 81 point uh, season in 82 games, almost a point per game. Very, very good for him. And Jason Robertson, as Tom mentioned before, probably one of the best players for the Dallas Stars this year. 41 goals scored by Jason Robertson this year. Very well. And as I uh, mentioned in our team previews, which go back to our team previews to kind of see what we got right and what we got wrong. Rupe Hintz, 72 points in 80 games. I knew that if he was given a full season to play, a full, mostly healthy season, you were going to get between 70 to 80 points. And I hit it right on the head, 72 points right there. Where there is a little bit of concern is just depth from the older crowd. And it's not even like older crowd, but, you know, Jamie Benn needs to step up in uh, a series like this. Uh, Alexander Radulov needs to step up in a series like this. Tyler Sagan also needs to step up. And the problem is, all three guys I mentioned, as opposed to Hints, Robertson, and Pavelski, all have minuses in their category. Tyler Sagan, minus 21. Jamie Benn, minus 13. Alexander Radulov, minus 20 on the year. I really don't take plus minus into a account, but I can't help but focus on it when you have other players on the team that have quite positive plus minus. Defensively, there's something wrong there from those players. So that's going to be the make or break for Dallas this year, uh, for this playoff. Consistency and finding the back of the net. They could steal a game or two from Calgary, and I think that a lot of people are writing this one off. I wouldn't write it off quite yet, although my prediction might say otherwise. So, Tom, what is your prediction here for this series? Well, for all of our uh, Cobra Kai fans out there and you uh, ever watch John Kreese say strike fear into the opponent, I think Dallas does strike some fear into Calgary during this series, but it's not nearly enough. It's not nearly enough. And maybe Calgary becomes Ralph Macchio and Miyagi, though, and they just say, okay, great, but um, uh, yeah, we're not going to live in fear. So I'm going to go with Calgary and six in this one. See, you're at least like kind of generous because you're giving Calgary in six. I'm far more mean. I'm going to quote uh, c- the Karate Kid. Sweep the leg, Johnny. And in this well, case, that's John Kreese yeah. too. That's John Kreese as well. Johnny Gaudreau is going to sweep the leg. And by sweep the leg, I mean that this is the other series that I think we actually could see a sweep. I'm going to say Calgary in four. I, I My thing is, it's just you don't want to know what Dallas – Dallas, you know, man, they 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 knocked Colorado off two years ago. They gave Tampa a little bit of a scare in the finals. I'm not saying they're going to go on that run that they went on, but I think that they could give Calgary a little bit of a scare here. I do. Anything's possible, but at the same time, most importantly, I, the first round of the playoffs is going to be a ton of fun, and we're going to have to do a lot of multitasking to keep up with all of these series, but it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be awesome. And with that, guys, that brings us to the end of this video. But what do you guys think? We want you guys to let us know down below. Join the conversation. Let us know what your predictions are and what you think 
are the most interesting things to watch for in these series coming up. The only way you do that is to comment down below. And next time we go live, drop a comment. Let us know what you agreed with, what you disagreed with. And so that way you know when we go live, make sure you subscribe. Hit the bell notification so that way you're notified every single time we go live, which we're going to be doing quite a bit during the Stanley Cup playoffs. And you can also drop a like if you really liked what you saw today. But you can also find our content on our website down below, iadsports.com, where you can find our NHL content as well as all of our other sports content and hit up our shop Get yourself a t-shirt as low as $8 and make sure you follow us down below on Twitter at I80 underscore sports NHL. And if you're following us already, thank you guys so much because we greatly value all of your support. And I also got to mention that with all of these matchups, I mean, Twitter basically was tit for tat on everything with us for the Toronto Tampa Bay series. A lot of people had Toronto winning that series about 56% of Twitter said Toronto for Boston and Carolina. Most people said Carolina, about 80% said Carolina. For New York, a astounding 90% said New York against Pittsburgh, so that makes Tom happy. For Florida, we had nearly unanimous. It was like 95% Florida last time I checked. I'm going to have to check and see uh, what it was last time. Colorado, 80% for Colorado to win that series. Uh, on the Los Angeles and Edmonton side, Edmonton had a surprising, surprisingly overwhelming response, like a 70% uh, said Edmonton. I don't know if I agree there. Minnesota and St. Louis, 50-50 split last time I checked. It, it, a Not lot of people said you know, either which way. And then Calgary, Dallas, I think last time I checked Calgary, it was like at a clear 90% there. So a lot of Twitter agreeing with our takes. And there's still time to vote in the poll. If you want to vote in that poll, you can just – Head on over to our Twitter. I'll drop it again just so that way you guys have it at I80 underscore sports NHL. Hit up our polls. Maybe you can uh, change a little bit of the results that we're talking about right now. But it's time to watch some playoff hockey. The regular season is over and playoff hockey begins. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Guys, enjoy the first round matchups. We'll be here to give you our recaps of the first round as it comes. But for now, I'm Brian. He's been Tom. This has been yet another episode of NHL on IED Sports.